morning, everybody. Good morning. How is everybody today? Good? Is everybody good? All right. Well, if you're uh, in the congregation, please stand and join us. Everybody on the fellowship hall, you're uh, free to continue fellowshipping, or if you'd like to join us, come on in. Why don't everybody stand up onto your feet? And uh, we, we have uh, a new guest singer with us. She's actually probably not a guest singer. She's going to keep singing with us. This is Maddie. Everybody say hi, Woo! Maddie. Hi, I Maddie. Know a lot of you know her. She's a senior at uh, North Muskegon. She's in the choir there. And she's an aspiring artist. I was just talking to her about her, uh, her plans in the future and applying to colleges for art and, and uh, maybe performance, too. So that's kind of cool. Uh, hey, we're going to start out with a song that uh, we did at the uh, fall kickoff uh, out in the parking lot. We just did this song once. But next week, we have our fall celebration coming up. So we thought, what a better song to sing at celebration than celebrate. And so we thought we'd sing it here this morning so that you kind of know what the song is after we do it for a couple of weeks. Come on, sing, sing.
there are still tickets left to the Wren Collective and Chris Tomlin's concert coming up in a couple of weeks. And uh, what's the date on it? Sixth, right? Seventh. November seventh. So that's Saturday. Uh, so anyway, it's, uh, it's in Grand Rapids, and the first two songs we just did are both Wren Collective uh, songs, and uh, we just we we the band just love that group, and of course Chris Tomlin too. Like you listen to Chris Tomlin, and it's like, oh, that's who sings that song. Oh, that's who does that song. Oh, that's it. just like he just does all of them. And uh, so anyway, just encourage you to go out there and. and uh,
your seats this morning. Take a few moments and greet each other. Friends, my young friends, come on down, and we'll see if Stanley makes it here today. Our box from the first service didn't make it, and uh, I know it was awful. We had to do something else, but Stanley is here. All right. Don't go too far. I might want Melissa to explain to us. Should I open it to you guys, or maybe I'll look at it first? It's not very heavy. It's kind of light today. It won't bite me, right? It's not alive. Oh, it is small. Let's see what it is. This is a hippo. It looks like a hippo face. Is it a hippo? Okay, yes. I don't usually see hippos standing up on two legs. That's a new thing for me. But this is also a, like something you could wear like on a string or something or could hang and has this got a special meaning to you? Did you get this someplace special, or what is this, this for you? You found it. Okay. All right. So when you found it, like, um, then you put it someplace, like, on your dresser or something, you kept it? Okay. So <clears throat> you found it. Let's go with that one. Found. We've got several stories in our Bible that remind us of things that get lost and then that get found again. Can you think of any of the lost and found stories in our Bible? There's one about a coin that gets lost. A woman loses a coin and she sweeps her whole house looking for that coin. And when she finds it, she's so happy she's found it, she ta tells all her neighbors to come and she celebrates. That's one of the lost and found. Can you think of another lost and found? What? Yeah, the lost son. It's part of the same group of three stories. So there's a story about a lost son, and the son gets lost and later on comes home. And what's, can you think of another one? That's the other one of the three stories. You guys are hitting home runs today. So lost and found. Those stories are in our Bible for a really special reason to remind us that even though we get lost, we get found again, that God wants, God is out there looking for us. Like if you know anybody, like you've probably all been lost sometime, right? Have you ever been lost? Yeah, like in a grocery store. I got lost in a grocery once. Oh man, I was so scared. And that was just last year. <laughs> now these days, if I get lost in a grocery store, it's like cool. I love grocery stores. But uh, when I was little, I was lost in a grocery store. One time I got lost at the fireworks. You know, it's dark out. There are many, many, many people, and I don't know where my family is, you know? And God is kind of like our parents are when we get lost. Our parents, believe it or not, your parents like you, and they don't, when you get lost, they're more worried and sensed than you are even. And they are doing anything, going to any length to find you. And they do. And it's all better and made well again. And so when you bring something that you found, now you didn't lose it because somebody else has lost it, right? And you found it. 
but it still reminds us of things that are lost and things that are found. Because even though it didn't get back to the original owner, I don't think anybody could have treated this with more respect than you did by taking it home and putting it in a place of honor. And then, in fact, bringing it here for us to see it. This hippopotamus has had a much different life, maybe, than it would have had had it never been lost. Um, it's made it to church. Not a lot of hippopotamuses make it to church, you know? So it's kind of a different thing for us. But I'm glad you brought him so you can remind us of this important thing about being lost and being found. Thanks for doing that. Let's have a prayer together, and then we'll head our, off in our directions. Lord, we thank you for the ways in which you uh, love us so completely, that you, you are like that great shepherd that goes out into the wilderness, beating the bushes to find the lost sheep. Sometimes we wander in our lives and we maybe stop going to church or we don't really live the lives that we should live, but it doesn't mean you don't love us. You love us every bit as much. And you go out looking for us and bringing us back to good places in our lives. We thank you for that. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Melissa, for bringing that in for us. All right. You guys can head off to your thing. The kids are showing up now in between services, too, for time to prepare for the Christmas program. So, you know, this is a good opportunity for us. If you know of some kids that don't have a church, um, Christmas program is like the coolest thing. And it's a time for kids to do something that's fun and really um, they'll learn a lot in the midst of it as well. Um, touch base with one of us adults afterwards and we'll help you to know how to make that connection and uh, for somebody in your neighborhood or somebody in your family. And, and over these weeks leading up towards Christmas, they'll become a part of a production that we'll do during the worship services in December. We'd love to have them involved. But it's great to see the kids here. Go for it, Guy. Excellent. Well, that's one of the great things we have in our church is that, is that fact that we have children that do a Christmas program, and another might be that we had vacation Bible school with our kids, and um, I think it's mother good kids ones. Uh, we've got youth group, and that's another good thing. And sometimes they sing for us on Sundays. They sing for us, yeah. and, and you know, sometimes it's hard to remember all the great things that happen in the life of our church. But the lucky thing is that next Sunday we're going to come together in this space to celebrate all the wonderful things that God's done in our midst here through this church as we celebrate. What we call our home runs, our things that, that, that we've planned, we've put together with God's help and God's work through those in our community and, and throughout our world even. Uh, some of them will be reaching to that distance as we share our finances around the world. But uh, that's a great time for us to come together and to celebrate those and to remember those because it's easy to just forget about those great things because they're here and they're gone. So be with us next week to celebrate those things. And then stay afterwards uh, as we uh, celebrate a pig rope together and we just enjoy fellowship around the table, getting to know each other, uh, spending time, maybe a chance if you've only been in this service, a chance to meet somebody from our earlier service or for them to meet some of you folks that are only here. So it's a great chance for us to gather as one church uh, that's doing things here in this community with God's help. With that, another great thing that's going on in our community is that there is a spaghetti supper also on that November the 7th. As Matt mentioned the Rent Collective concert. And that's a wonderful thing as well, but another is a spaghetti supper that our church is putting on to try to help uh, Caleb, uh, Calum and Ter Tara. Tara and yep. Yeah, sorry. I always want to call, call him Caleb because of Caleb. Anyway, Caleb and Tara, as they work on adopting a child, and the expenses are great for that, and it's just one of those things that we can step up as a church to try to help them with that. So invite folks to come out on November 7th for that spaghetti supper that they can be a part of that. And then last... Oh, our giving statements, our giving homes, do we have one of those in these? I think they're in our bulletin. If not, if you're a visitor with us this morning for the first time, then please do not take worry of these. This is something that as we have gathered for these last several weeks, we've heard different moments about the wonderful things that, that we try to use the money that's given at this church, that we try to use to further God's glory in our community. Um, and this is a chance for folks to turn in what, what they think they're going to be able to give next year. It's not a, nobody's going to send you a bill or anything crazy like that, but it's a chance for us to take and as a finance committee try to plan and know what we're going to have resource-wise next year to, to see what programs we can put together. So if you're somebody that's regular with us, that's a regular giver with us, we encourage you, if you don't mind, to fill this out. Drop it in the plate back there, the box back there in our plate, uh, just so that that group can help, uh, help put stuff together and know what money's going to be there and what resources are going to be there. So thank you for all of it. Time for us to pray. 
And uh, as we pray today, um, it's been a full last couple of weeks. We've had a couple of funerals in the last couple of weeks that change our schedule around here significantly. And uh, uh, Elaine was our last person we lost just this last week, 95 years old, a glorious woman. And we had a celebration for her life in this room, over a couple hundred people, and we had bagpipes, and we had mandolin, and we had piano and organ and all kinds of fun stuff, and it was just a celebration, just just you can't imagine. Well, last night I came in here to get ready for the service, and I, I noticed this Bible laying here in the front pew, and I, it happens from time to time. People leave their Bibles here, and I thought somebody went off and left their Bible, and I, somebody indeed went off and left their Bible. This is Elaine's Bible. And uh, so as we gather here today, you know, um, a real reminder of Elaine. And we're going to be talking about worship today. And as we do, um, you know, Elaine's words. I, after the second service, I, or after the first service, I just opened the Bible and found a couple of the things that she underlined in her Bible. And one of the things I found right off was about don't let our light be under a bushel. Let it shine so everyone can, can bring their praises and glories to God. And that's kind of the neatest kind of word in a sense from beyond the grave she sends us a word of celebration what is worship it's about holding god up and and being able to celebrate what god's done in our lives so that's what we're going to talk about today and i just kind of thank elaine for giving me an underscore on that what a sweet thing you know we'll get this back to the family i think what happened is they were doing a wonderful display up here for the service and this was something that was either a part of it or intending to be a part of it and it got left behind and i couldn't be happier be able to have it and it's the living bible you know and i'm thinking of elaine as being such a living presence um we're reminded that you know this idea of eternal life is so real for those of us who who claim it so keep that in mind but who else are we praying for besides elaine's family are there others we're holding up joys or concerns things we want to remember yes It's a very hard thing, and let's keep that family unnamed in our prayers. And let's remember that this is not an isolated thing. There are people within our lives and within our reach that are facing great stress and problems and depression and other things. Let's keep them in our prayers as they all face these kinds of things. Thank you for sharing. Others that we hold up today. Anybody else that we're thinking of? Yes, Bob. That's so true, Bob. You know, we pray for our families as they travel in relative safety from point A to point B, but the, the things that a lot of these families are up against are enormous. And let's keep them in our thoughts as they make these journeys. Thanks for sharing. Who else are we holding up today? Yes. Yes. That's right. Thanks, Kathy. That's true, too. We, we aren't a place where being out in the weather in this kind of condition is going to be easy at all. So let's keep them in our thoughts. Thanks. Who else? Yes. Oh, good. Oh, that's great. Is it our own kids playing? Oh, excellent. Your sister and you and yeah. All right, let's keep you guys, you know, this is a celebration. It is a prayer. I mean, you know, when our own community is able to generate wonderful things like that are inspiring and entertaining, and, and we're so proud of you guys. It's great. Thanks, Madeline. Anybody else we're praying for, other things we hold up? Yes. Like Texas and some of the things, yeah. Mexico, yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, that's right, Deb. Let's keep in our prayers. Yes.
That's right, B. Thank you for sharing because we we do have uh, at our fingertips so much great care, and so uh, thank you for sharing that. Appreciate it, B. Which reminds me of of uh, one of our own, Shirley, who is our actually a person. Believe it or not, uh, Shirley and I. I don't use last names often because when I talk over the microphone, often these are broadcast over the Internet later on. So I use first names typically. I want you to know that's why I don't use last names. But Shirley is the head of our worship area, and uh, she's had a difficult week, um, probably something going on with her heart, arrhythmia kind of things, and she feels yucky, really bad. And so she's taking a leave of absence as our worship chair in the foreseeable future right now um, so that she can figure out what's going on and they can treat what's going on. So if you'll pray with me to keep Shirley in our prayers, we would not be where we're at in terms of getting our new service off the ground and we're all here for this if it hadn't been for her diligence and her attention. So let's keep Shirley in our prayers, please. Yes, you want to share a little about home? Yes. These these young people in our church are so amazing. So yeah, Doug, thanks for holding them up. Um, let's keep them in our thoughts. Any other people? Yeah, Jer. Allison, you're in our prayers. It's, uh, when our eyes hurt, nothing kind of goes right. So let's keep you in our thoughts. Anybody else that we have in our thoughts and prayers this week? You are a praying bunch today. Let's come together in prayer. Gracious God, you do call us to this place, and you do remind us that as we gather, um, we are more than the sum of the people in this room, that it is just amazing what we can find and discover from each other and as we share our prayers together we are reminded we're not alone and we're reminded that you're with us as well help us to um, respond to these prayers when we can in ways that make a, a difference but lord help us to always remember that our prayers are are open-ended they continue throughout our days throughout our weeks our months our years that our lives, in fact, can be living prayers. We hold this up to you in your name. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is going to be from um, Psalms, the 66th book. We're going to look at verses 1 through 5. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. Come and see what God has done, his awesome deeds for mankind. Thank you, Kim. We are in our last week of our 40-day study that we've done here in the church. Um, it's all about community. It's all about being, indeed, better together. Um, that, that as we come together, there's something that benefits 
potentially all of us. And so our last, our last time, our last week, our last subject that we're looking at, and our small groups that have been meeting are looking at this um, in, a, in a small group setting as well. But, but as we gather here, we're talking about worship today and, and how you know, worship happens in so many different ways. It happens uh, when we're alone, but also happens when we're together. Um, we probably all have our own mental image of what it means to worship, depending on our, our church background. We probably represent all kinds of church backgrounds. We may, somebody in this group may think of a classical sacred music with a big choir singing hallelujah choruses, or somebody else when they hear the word worship might think maybe an image comes to mind of a small clapboard church building, a white kind of structure off on a hill where there's, you know, people kind of filing in and the old great hymns are going to be sung, the old rugged cross or how great thou art or Maybe, maybe there are people here in the room today that as we mention this idea or word of worship, they're thinking about a charismatic or more Pentecostal kind of experience that they have, and they envision a scene of hands raised or maybe even something a lot more active than that. Or maybe, maybe as we gather here, some of you aren't thinking about music and singing at all. Perhaps for you the word worship brings up images of structured liturgy and prayer books, or a pastor or a priest presenting in one manner or another, or people sitting quietly with their heads bowed, maybe praying or meditating, or maybe even somebody on their knees. There are probably as many images of what constitutes worship as there are people in this room. The word worship is a, is a broad term. Merriam-Webster defines worship as to honor or reverence as a divine being or supernatural power. Or the second thing that Webster talks to us about is to regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. And third, the definition that they give is to perform or take part in worship as an act of worship. Then if we open up the thesaurus, and we take a look at the entries there to the word worship, we'll find revere, adore, and love. Several years back, in his book, Purpose Driven Life, Rick Warren, who is the writer of the program that we're using in our 40-day study right now, he says, anything that we do that brings pleasure to God is an act of worship. Ralph Martin says, Worship is the dramatic celebration of God in God's supreme worth in such a manner that God's worthiness becomes the norm and the inspiration of human living. That one's a little more complicated. Or William Temple, I really kind of like what he says when I listen close to it. Worship is the submission of all our nature to God. It's the quickening of conscience by God's holiness. It's the nourishment of mind with God's truth. It's the purifying of imagination by God's beauty. It's the opening of the heart to God's love. The surrender of will to God's purpose. And all of this gathered up in adoration, which is the most selfless emotion of which our nature is capable and therefore the chief remedy for our self-centeredness. I suspect that a lot of us would agree that worship is attributing of ultimate worth to something. Whether it's an object or a person or or an idea, worshiping is the valuing of one thing above everything else. It's perhaps literally worth-ship, giving worth to things. So when we, when we sing our praise songs as we did today here and we gather, there is the potential that we're proclaiming that God has the greatest possible worth. That God's value is above that of gold and silver and jewels and houses and land. We're testifying to the power that God has to exceed everything every king, every president, every dictator in all of history. And that the glory of God's holiness outshines 
the billions of stars in the sky in every galaxy. When we worship God, we're saying that nothing compares. Our Lord is above all, greater than all. Everything in creation pales next to the sovereign Lord of the universe. Listen to what John's letter, um, as we read the Revelation, which is the last book in our New Testament, from the fourth and fifth chapters, we catch statements like this. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And in a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. It sounds like a song, doesn't it? God alone is supremely worthy of our praise and our love and our devotion and our service, both because of who God is and what God has done. The Old Testament, the book of Psalms, which is what we heard from today, is actually a hymn book in itself. It's a hymn book of ancient Israel, and it's full of examples of worship and praise. In fact, there's little notations, little words that appear throughout the Psalms. And you may, as you're reading them, you think, what is this word for? And the fact of the matter is we don't fully understand because it's some kind of a notation that reminds the people of that time something musical about what's going on here. It's something liturgical. It's a hymn book. It's a worship book. And it's not just hundreds, but even thousands of years old. But you know, at the end of the day, worship isn't simply making an objective judgment that one thing excels above all others. Worship is also an active desiring or seeking after that thing that we identify as being above all others. So it's not just naming it, but it's acting in some way out of that. To worship something is to make the pursuit and the enjoyment of it the overriding goal of our life. I think that's what Jesus was talking about when he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That's worship. Valuing something so highly that we would give everything we have for it. Listen to what Jesus said about God's kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, remember? Remember? When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy he sold everything he had and he bought that field. And then Jesus went on to say again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found the one of great value, he went out and he sold everything he had and he bought that pearl. Worshiping is treasuring the things of God so highly that we'll give everything we have in exchange for them. It's an attitude that says, whatever it takes for me to know and experience God, that I will do. So a core question for us today, as we come together for worship, is, perhaps, is it possible to worship someone or something other than God? And of course, we know the answer, sadly, is, Yes. In fact, everyone worships something. It's never a matter of if we worship. It's always a matter of what we worship. It's kind of hardwired in us to worship. I think that it's part of what it means to be human. But in light of our failure to choose God as that which we worship, I think it gives rise to statements like the Apostle Paul when he, when he writes, Although they knew God, they neither glorified God as God nor gave thanks to God, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. The Apostle Paul goes on to write, Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like humans and birds and animals and reptiles. They exchanged the truth of God for that which isn't true. 
and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. That was one of Paul's letters to the Romans. As Americans, I would suggest we live in a predominantly secular world. And so we don't really find ourselves like bowing down before little statues and idols maybe, but instead our culture tends to worship things. Things like money, success, and physical strength and beauty. (laughs) See? We can kind of get you going on it because we think about those things or property or power or fame or safety or security or we, we even worship things like leisure. You know, it's something that we put at the center. You know, it's whatever we organize our lives around would be the thing that we idolize, wouldn't it? Whatever we put first, whatever we seek above everything else, that's what we're worshiping. You know, if people could take a look at all of our you know, our checkbooks or our bank statements. We've said this before. Or people could look at our calendars and they could look at our lives very intimately and see the way we've organized ourselves. It says something about our values and it ultimately says something about what's at the very center of who we are. Fundamentally, it seems that we're not only worshipers by nature, but we're also worshipers of self. seeking after our own welfare and our own happiness is so often the greatest good in our lives. It's a problem that humanity suffers. And so our God-given drive to worship is somehow perverted. It turns from being this to being this. Turned on itself, it it gives in to the urge to make oneself a, a little God in a sense, to place ourselves at the center of the universe. Now we we feel pretty good about ourselves because we know that there's good in us too. We're kind of like last week we were talking about their sheep and their goats, and we're kind of sheepy and goaty, you know, both of us. I mean, we hold both of those realities in our lives often, don't we? And we also look out into the world and we see maybe a terrible dictator someplace on the planet, and we go. Now that's, that guy really thinks of himself as being the center of the universe. The way not only he acts, but he structured a society around himself so that everything points inward. But we're not off the hook. Because we do it in our own smaller ways, in our own lives. And so we ask, what are we to do? How are we to break out of this? And what, what is worship in a healthy way, what does it really look like? What kind of worship pleases God? And I know that people would love for me to say contemporary music or traditional music or prayers that are written or prayers that are this or something that's that, you know, because people, the worship wars are going on in our world. In a Christian world, you know, the people that are outside the church, probably many of them stay away from us because we got all these battles going on within the context of, of the church and And they don't want to have anything to do with often the internals of being a Christian. I know people would probably love for me to just settle this once and for all, but you know what? I have not got that answer for you today. And I won't have it next week either. Because it's not about that question. What kind of worship truly pleases God is different in style. First of all, true worship, I think we all know this, it comes from the heart. Listen to what Jesus said to the woman at the well. Now, we've talked about the woman at the well several times in the last month. The Samaritan woman. Sir, she said to Jesus, I can see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on the mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. These are important words that follow. And Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. 
The time is coming and has indeed arrived when true worship of the Father will come in the Spirit and truth. I think this means that God really doesn't care about where we worship or what kind of building we worship in, as beautiful as this is, or what we're wearing when we worship, or God isn't fooled by our outward appearances. We may appear to be devout and sincere and pious and all those things. We may sing hymns and songs and do it really well, and we may have compassionate prayers, or we may serve on the worship team, or we may help behind the scenes. But if our spirituality is merely external, if we're just going through the motions, well, I would suspect that we're not worshiping from the heart. It just doesn't accomplish what needs to be accomplished in the end. God isn't interested in that kind of pseudo-spirituality God wants the real thing. Listen to what the prophet Isaiah writes. And it's the words of God. He's prophesying here. The people come near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That's not what God wants. The kind of worshipers God longs for are those who worship from the heart, the spirit and truth. If, if God doesn't have our heart, then God, then nothing that we do like on Sunday morning or any other day of the week is, is really going to make the difference. God wants us. You know, God simply longs for us. Sincerely. God wants us to come voluntarily. You know, those of you that are parents and your kids have left home, we want our kids to come home because they want to come home, right? Not because we bugged them and bugged them and bugged them and bugged them and twisted their arms and made them to feel guilty. Now, I love my mother dearly, but every time we'd get together in that last 15 years of her life, she'd say, this may be the last time we ever gather. Bless her heart, she couldn't help but saying that. And we gathered a whole bunch more time. There would be that last time. And in, in that sense, she was right. Once. <laughs> she just didn't know how to move beyond the guilt thing. And perhaps as a son, I should have been more attentive. God doesn't want to do the guilt thing even though we make it up in the world and we religious leaders do the guilt thing to try to get people here. God wants us to be here because we want to be here. Wherever here is, wherever worship occurs, and it can be absolutely anywhere, God wants us to be connected and in relationship out of sheer love. A man told of the time his son was coming up towards his sixth birthday, and the little guy, he mentioned that he wouldn't mind a party. <laughs> what little six-year-old doesn't want a party, you know? And usually this little guy was very specific about everything, about what he wanted for presents and all that kind, but he didn't say much. So Dad, whose name is Bill, expected a, this well-planned response when he said, what, what kind of thing would you like? He expected his son to say, well, I'd like a baseball glove, and you'll find it at Toys R Us in aisle six, just below the batting helmets. You know, that kind of description. This little guy was always very specific. But he said, what do you want? And he really wasn't that specific. He said, I'd kind of like a ball. Well, what kind of ball would you like? It's great. And he said, oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe a football or a soccer ball. Well, which one do you want more, Dad said. Well, he thought about it, and he said, well, if you have some time to play with me this year, then maybe I'd like a football because we could take it out in the yard and you and I, we could play catch. But if you don't have any time, then get me a soccer ball because the kids in the neighborhood like to play soccer. The dad thought about this. 
And he said, let me surprise you. How's that sound? And his little son smiled up at him. He says, gosh, Dad, that'd be great. I really love you. Then Bill went inside. And he shared his encounter with his son, with his wife. And together they agreed their son wasn't so much interested in the gift as in the giver. Adoration. Worship. Oh, you've all heard me say it before, I suspect. You know, we don't have to be here. We get to be here. And when we enter into any moment of worship, and that's the way we feel about life and about what God has done for us, we're, we're ready. May God bless each one of us that we find that spot in our lives we too can be ready. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Precious Lord, worship. We engage in it with some frequency, and yet, Lord, sometimes we are so far from what it is you call us to be and to do. Stir within our souls, within our hearts, so that we might capture and recapture just what it is you call us to experience. In your name we pray. Amen. So we're going to finish the service with the um, first time we've done it here, but I've, I've had the opportunity to be blessed by this song for 10 years. Um, and it, it's a joy that I can bring this to you. This is one of my favorite songs to sing. Um, I, I just connect with it really well. Uh, the words in the first, uh, Doug, could you put the words for the first verse up there? Um, words for the first verse are, going back to the verse about the alabaster jar and how the, the woman breaks the alabaster jar full of perfume at Jesus' feet. And this alabaster jar is all I have of worth. I break it at your feet, Lord. It's less than you deserve. And the, the words for verse 2 begin similarly, but it, instead of the alabaster jar, it's this time that I have left is all I have of worth. I lay it at your feet, Lord. It's less than you deserve. Please stand and join us.
Lord, we offer ourselves. And we go out into the world spreading the good news of the gospel. Go in peace. Amen. Don't forget the pig roast next week. Bring a friend. It's going to be a wonderful celebration. Yeah, but I'm a loser.